name is Chris. I would like to share how I built a non-inverting operational amplifier circuit in order to feed an audio signal from a soundbar to a microcontroller, such as this Arduino Uno. With this circuit, I can control LED lights using the Arduino in order to make the lights respond to music as I play it, just like with the Spectrum Analyzer. I have here a soundbar that I plan on putting inside of a van. This soundbar can be connected to via Bluetooth, so with my phone or my laptop, and it has two RCA cables here that will output any audio the soundbar is playing. So, I should be able to take a RCA to 3.5 millimeter audio converter and then feed the audio signal that is coming off of the converter straight to the Arduino Uno, right? Well, no. It's more complicated than that. The analog input pins on the Arduino Uno are designed to read analog signals between 0 and 5 volts. This input is fed through an analog to digital converter so that you can call the analog read function on the Arduino Uno and get back a value between 0 and 2 to the 10th power minus 1. Any voltages below 0 volts or above 5 will not only be useless as the microcontroller cannot read them, but improper voltages could potentially damage the Arduino over time. This is a problem because the signal coming off of the RCA outputs of the soundbar will be an analog signal centered around 0 volts. So half of the signal will be above 0 volts, which is fine, but the other half that is negative will not only be unreadable by the Arduino, but could be harmful to the pins. Outside of this, there is one other problem with the signal we are trying to read. Let's assume that the signal we are reading stayed above 0 volts and never dips into the negative. The other problem we have is that the amplitude of the signal on the RCA lines is pretty weak. The volume that the soundbar is currently at affects the voltage of the RCA line. If I turn the soundbar to maximum volume, the peak-to-peak -peak strength of the signal is only around 1 volt. Even if the signal was centered around 500 millivolts instead of 0 volts, like it really is, we would still have a problem where we were only making use of one-fifth of the accuracy the Arduino can handle. Instead of getting a reading that ranged between 0 and 1023, our readings would only vary from the center of our signal by about 102, causing us to lose a lot of detail on the sound that we are reading. We really don't need to use the extra range. Maybe this lack of accuracy would be perfectly fine for your application, but I want the Arduino to be able to detect subtle changes in the sound. More detail is better, right? So, before I pass the signal to the microcontroller, there are two things I want to do. We need to amplify the signal so that it uses more of the 0 to 5 volt range that we can read, and we need to push the signal up by 2.5 volts, biasing the signal so that it does not drop below 0 volts. We can accomplish this by using what's called an operational amplifier. Operational amplifiers are integrated circuits that can be used to take an input signal and increase the amplitude of it while maintaining the pattern of the original signal. We are going to start by amplifying our audio signal the way we need to, and we'll worry about biasing it later. Our ultimate goal is to have a signal that is centered around 2.5 volts and has a peak to peak of 5 volts. This will cause our signal to cycle between the full range of what the Arduino can read. Keeping in mind that at full volume our RCA has a peak to peak of 1 volt, we want to amplify our signal by a factor of 5. This is a TL072IP dual op amp that I bought online. You can configure an op amp in a variety of ways to get different effects out of it, but the configuration that we need is what is called a non-inverting amplifier circuit. An inverting amplifier would flip the audio signal, and we don't want that. An op amp has two inputs, the positive, also called the non-inverting input, and the negative, or inverting input. For a non-inverting circuit, the input audio signal is connected to the non-inverting pin, and the output of the amplifier is tied back to the inverting pin through a resistor, which we'll refer to as R1. After R1 is another resistor, R2, which connects to ground. Without getting too deep into theory on how operational amplifiers work, which if you're interested in, there's plenty of good videos out there on that, just understand that the op amp will multiply the signal present on the non-inverting pin by the ratio of R1 divided by R2 plus 1. So, if we want to multiply the signal by a factor of 5, we just need to select R1 and R2 values where R1 divided by R2 is around 4. We don't want to choose resistor values that are too small, because the smaller these values are, the more current will actually pass through them. Values around 100 kilo ohms seem to work just fine. 
With the op amp configured correctly, we now need to add the DC bias to ensure that the signal is always above zero volts. First, we want to add a capacitor between the RCA output and the op amp's non-inverting input pin. This will isolate the signal and the op amp from any DC noise that may be present. We also want to add another capacitor, before or after R2. I believe this capacitor prevents the DC voltage we are introducing from being amplified by the op amp. To actually introduce the DC bias, we add a voltage divider composed of two resistors. This voltage divider is also connected to ground with a large capacitor, in order to filter out any noise or inconsistent voltage coming from the power supply. The voltage divider is then connected to the non-inverting input of the op amp through a large resistor, biasing the input signal upwards. We can measure the amount of voltage that we are introducing to our circuit with the formula for the midpoint of a voltage divider, which is the voltage of our power supply multiplied by the resistance of R3 divided by R3 plus R4. If R3 and R4 are equal to each other, the DC bias introduced will be half of the supplied voltage. In my case, I will be using a 12 volt power supply and want to add around 2.5 volts to the op amp input. 2.5 divided by 12 is 0 0.208. So I need R3 divided by R3 plus R4 to be roughly 0 0.2. Again, it would be best to use resistor values around 100k in order to minimize current draw. So I will use a 100k resistor for R3 and about a 400k resistor for R4. The resistor connecting to the non-inverting input should just be a value moderately larger than R3 and R4. So I'll just use one mega ohm. With our bias and op amp circuit planned out, we can start setting it up on a breadboard to test it. Let's start by placing the op amp right in the center of our breadboard here. We'll attach VCC, the positive voltage reference. We'll also attach ground to the negative VCC pin. Let me turn this to the side to make this next part a little easier to see. This is R1, connecting the output back to the inverting input pin. Next, we're connecting the inverting pin to R2 and then through our one microfarad capacitor to ground. This is the circuit that will control the gain of the op amp. Now we need to add the bias voltage divider. We'll add R4. R3 is next, as well as the 47 microfarad capacitor. The voltage divider is put together and this one mega ohm resistor connects the voltage divider to the non-inverting input, which introduces the bias that we want. Finally, this 22 nanofarad ceramic capacitor will separate the non-inverting pin and the RCA line that we'll be connecting in a moment. At this point, the circuit itself has been set up. Now I need to connect the breadboard power rails and cigarette socket together so I can power them with my bench power supply. I'm also going to be inserting the prongs from my oscilloscope using jumper wire so we can really see what is happening with the analog signals. I'll connect the first channel of my oscilloscope in line with the raw RCA output coming from the soundbar, before the input capacitor. I'm then going to insert the ground wires and connect the second channel to the output of the op amp. For the RCA connection, I'm going to wrap this stranded wire around the left channel portion of the 3.5mm audio jack, and hold it in place with this alligator clip. This is super janky, but it'll work. The other end of the stranded wire connects here. The cigarette socket has small ring terminals I can use to easily connect the breadboard power rails to. Before I actually hook up the power supply, I'm going to double check that it is set to provide 12 volts and 1 amp should be good enough. After hooking up the power supply to the ring terminals and plugging the soundbar into the cigarette socket, I can turn on my power supply and the soundbar should turn on. Now I can connect to my soundbar with my laptop and play some noise so we can check the sound signal that is playing. The output from music is a bit too chaotic to read well and measure, so instead I'm going to use a website to play a tone at a frequency of 220 Hz, which is the frequency of an A note. This will produce a nice sine wave on the oscilloscope and be easy to read. 
A sound wave oscillating 220 times per second sounds like this. As you can see, the input signal, in yellow, is oscillating around 6 millivolts, with a peak-to-peak -peak of about 100 millivolts. If I turn on the second channel connected to the op amp's output pin, you can see that the op amp is outputting the same exact signal as the input, but biased and amplified so that it is oscillating around 2.37 volts with a peak to peak of about 190 millivolts. So this is amplifying the input by right around two times. So we know that our circuit is working and amplifying the signal, which is great. But if you're being observant, you may notice that the signal is only being amplified by about two times. That is because I used two 100 kilo ohm resistors for R2 and R1. Looking at the formula for gain that we discussed earlier, this means we should be expecting to see a gain of 100k divided by 100k plus 1, which is 2. In order to get closer to the 5x gain we were aiming for, let's swap out R1 with this 390 kilo ohm resistor, which should give us the 5x gain we are looking for, or at least close to it. Now that I'm confident the voltage is properly prepared for the Arduino to read, I'll connect the output pin of the op amp to the A0 pin on my Arduino. After uploading a brief script that just reads from pin A0 and prints out the red value, we can see that the Arduino is reading a healthy audio signal that doesn't drop below 0 volts and has much more detail than if we didn't amplify the signal at all. A peak to peak of 100 millivolts, like we were seeing before, would barely register on the Arduino only causing the red value to fluctuate by about 20 of its 0 to 10, 23 range. From here, you can do just about anything you can think of with the audio input on the Arduino or any other microcontroller. Keep in mind that if you use an ESP32 instead of an Arduino, the pins on the microcontroller will expect to read up to 3.3 volts and not 5. Be sure to double check the voltage tolerances of the pins on your microcontroller so you know how much you need to bias and amplify the signal by in order not to risk damage. When I originally wrote the script for this video, this is where it ended. I was going to ask you to like and leave a comment, you know, that algorithm-driven engagement metric nonsense, and be happy with what I had made and everything I learned while getting this circuit to work. Then I noticed something, something big that I had missed that drastically changed my plans with this video. Everything I have explained thus far has been true and works, but I missed one important detail that changes everything. Remember this website I used to play the 220Hz tone? See that volume slider? It didn't occur to me at first that I needed to turn that volume slider all the way up to truly see the maximum voltage range on the RCA output. If I do that, the peak-to-peak -peak range is actually closer to 3 volts, not 1 like I originally thought. But more importantly, look what happens on the oscilloscope when I turn the volume up to near maximum. See how the bottom half of the amplified signal is clipping and bottoming out? This puzzled me when I first saw it. I didn't understand why the signal was clipping, and I certainly didn't understand why only one side of the waveform was clipping. I was a bit demoralized at this point, because it took a lot of time and effort getting everything right for the circuit, only for it to turn out that the amplification was unnecessary, and it didn't even work properly if I turned it up too loud. It felt like I had been shoved back to square one, after putting in a lot of effort. I also realized that if I don't amplify the signal at all, when I have the sound at a reasonable, moderate level, the audio signal will still be fairly weak. If I connect to my soundbar and play music, I can only get to around 70% volume before it starts to become obnoxiously loud in my room. Considering the van is also going to be a relatively small, enclosed space, I suspect the volume levels that are tolerable in my room will be roughly similar. I will almost never play music at or near the maximum volume my soundbar can go, so when I have the soundbar at around 50% volume, which is probably about as loud as I'll want to play most music, the peak-to-peak -peak range is about 220 millivolts. If I want to listen to music at a relatively low volume in order to just chill out, the peak-to-peak -peak range will be greatly less than this because the voltage grows faster and faster as you turn the volume up. It doesn't grow linearly. So, most of the time I probably do want to amplify the signal because I'm not going to be playing music at volumes that are near the limit of what the soundbar can do, but if I amplify the signal by 3 or 5 times, and I do turn it up too loud, I could damage my microcontroller with signals peaking well in excess of 3.3 volts. So I had a dilemma on my hands. After thinking about this for a few days, I had an idea. What if I got my hands on a digital potentiometer? 
A digital potentiometer is an integrated circuit that acts as a resistor, where you can raise or lower the resistance of it by sending it digital signals. So, I could add one of these in place of resistor R1, so that I could raise or lower the gain of the circuit based on the strength of the signal coming off of the soundbar. If the signal is weak, I raise the gain in order to get more detail out of the sound. If the volume goes up too high, and the signal is getting too strong, I can lower the gain to protect the microcontroller. With this new idea in mind, I went online and ordered this X9C104 digital potentiometer. The X9C104 can range between nearly 0 ohms up to 100 kilo ohms. Aside from the pins that need to be connected to plus 5 volts and ground, the X9C104 has 6 pins we need in order to use it properly. Increment, up down, chip select, resistor high, resistor wiper, and resistor low. Increment, up down, and chip select all handle the control of the Digipot. A lot of Digipots have this simple 3 wire interface. The Digipot will respond to input signals on the increment and up down pins only if the chip select pin is low. So we could have multiple Digipots and control each of them individually, but that won't be necessary. I'll just end up tying this pin to ground. When the increment pin is dropped from digital high to digital low, the integrated circuit will lower or raise its resistance by moving the internal wiper closer to resistor high or resistor low, depending on whether up down is high or low. Again, if you want more detail on how digital potentiometers work, there are good resources out there on that. I'm just going to leave it at that though. I'm going to connect the output pin of the op amp to the resistor low pin of the digipot. Resistor wiper will be connected back to the inverting input pin of the op amp so that it is now playing the role of resistor R1 in the op amp circuit. Resistor high can either be tied to resistor wiper or left floating. When I raise or lower the resistance of the digipot, the amplification of the op amp will change as well. This, I believe, will technically work. However, there's one potential issue with this setup. The GPIO pins of the ESP32 will output 3.3 volt logic levels. 3.3 volts is high enough to trigger the signal pins on the X9C104, but I think communicating with it using a 5 volt logic level would be better. I'm worried if, for whatever reason, the GPIOs output slightly less than the 3.3 volts that they should, the signal won't be high enough to trigger the digipot. To accomplish this, I have these SN74AHC125 quadruple bus buffer ICs that I can use to convert up to four different input pins up to 5 volts. The wiring on these is pretty straightforward. It needs plus 5 volts VCC, as well as ground, and then it has four groups of three pins where the A pin would be the 3.3 volt logic, and the Y pin would be the same signal as on the A pin, but at 5 volts. The third pin can just be tied to ground. After connecting the bus buffer as a middleman between the microcontroller and the digipot, I can now be confident that the digipot is getting clear signals on its input pins. The next thing we need to do is figure out what value of resistance to use for R2 now that R1 is our 0 to 100k digital potentiometer. If we leave R2 at 100k, like we had it before, then when our digipot is turned all the way down, the formula for gain will be nearly 0 divided by 100k plus 1. So basically 1, or no effective gain. When the digipot is turned all the way up, the gain would be nearly 100k divided by 100k plus 1, so 2. This means our gain would range between 1 and 2x amplification depending on how we adjust the resistance of the digipod. This would work if we wanted our gain to vary between 1 and 2, but we probably want a bit more potential gain than just 2. Also, having the resistance of R1 be near 0 is probably a bad idea. A lot of current would be leaking from the output pin of the op amp and circling back to the inverting input pin. I'm not sure if this would really be a problem for the op amp, but I just don't think this would be good design. What we should do is add a resistor in series with the digipot so that R1 always has a base level of resistance and the digipot simply adds to it as needed. Choosing good values for R2 and R1 is tricky because this digipot only goes up to 100 kilo ohms, which limits the range of resistance values we can use for R2 and R1. We don't want to use too small of resistors in order to limit the current drain. But if we choose two large resistors, then the 100 kilo ohm digipot will have little effect on the actual gain. After some experimentation of trying different values and seeing how they affected the gain on the oscilloscope, 
the values I ended up with are 56k for R2 and 10k for R1. This means when our digipod is low, our gain will be near 0 plus 10k divided by 56k plus 1, or about 1.18, and when our digipod is high, the gain will be 100k plus 10k divided by 56k plus 1, about 3. I would have liked to have a higher potential gain for when the volume is low, but this was the best middle ground in my opinion of having a relatively small minimum gain with a decent maximum gain while not risking too much current draw. If I had a digipot that went up to 1 mega ohm instead of 100 kilo ohms, or simply had more of them to place in series, I could have had a better range of gains to choose from. But I only ordered two of these digipots, and when I was experimenting, I managed to kill the first one on accident. So this is what I can do with what I have. Now we can have the microcontroller constantly checking the output of the op amp to see if the volume levels are getting too high or too low. If they are, we can turn up or down the resistance of the digipod as necessary, changing the game from roughly 18% up to 200% as we see fit. At this point, the op amp and its gain has been sorted out and will work the way we want. However, we need to revisit the voltage divider from earlier that we use to bias the signal to 2.5 volts. The midpoint for the ESP32 would be 3.3 volts divided by 2. Now that we are using the ESP32, we want to bias the input voltage up 1.65 volts to put the signal right in the center of its analog read range. The batteries I am using will output between 12 and 13 volts of power if the charge is healthy. Let's take the 1.65 volt target that we want and divide it by 12.5, giving us 0 0.132. This tells us that we want R3 divided by R3 plus R4 to be roughly 0 0.13 in order to introduce 1.65 volts of bias. If I choose 27k for the smaller of the pair, because that's just one of the values that I have, and divide 27 by 0 0.13, I get about 207. So, if I choose a value for R4 around 200 kilo ohms, that should work fine. I have 180 kilo ohm resistors, so let's just use those. 12.5 times 27 divided by 27 plus 180 equals 1.63. So this is close to perfect and our bias should now be proper for the ESP32. I can now modify the breadboard circuit we set up earlier to add the new functionality we just designed. Here's a diagram of the new circuit I'll be setting up. First I'm going to move the current circuitry on the breadboard in order to make room. You can open up this video in two windows if you want to view the diagram and the finished circuit side by side. With the new circuit laid out, our bias and gain should be set up exactly the way we want. However, if I start playing audio and look at the oscilloscope to check what is happening, you can see that we're getting absolutely nothing on the output of the op amp, literally just a flat line. Uh oh, did we wire something incorrectly? Maybe miscalculate something? I find this is what is truly challenging when trying new things in microelectronics. It's difficult to know if a problem like this stems from a simple wiring mistake, a defective part, or a larger misunderstanding of the theory of what you are doing. Thankfully, I do know what the issue is here. Do you remember earlier how I mentioned the output was being clipped when I played audio near maximum volume? The reason for that has to do with these two pins on the op amp and the voltages you connect them to. To properly use one of these op amp chips, you want to give this positive pin a positive reference voltage, which is normal and easy. But this other pin is not intended to just be ground. This other pin should be given a negative voltage reference equal to, but opposite of, the positive end. So in my case, I would want to have one be positive 12 and the other negative 12. But I only had this one bench power supply, so I don't have an easy way to create a negative 12 volt reference to use. So I had just been connecting the negative end to ground. This setup worked so long as the output of the op amp was staying far enough away from the 0 and 12 volt rails. Op amps can only amplify a signal within the range of these two reference points you provide it. If you try to amplify a signal past 12 volts, or below zero, it won't work. It will start clipping the signal once the output gets too close to one of these rails. This is why when I turned the volume up enough, the bottom end of the signal was clipping, because it was only centered around 2.5 volts, and started to swing too close to the zero volt rail. The reason we have a flat line now is because 1.65 volts is not adequately far enough from the zero volt bottom rail for the op amp to be able to function correctly. 
To get this to work now, we need to give it a proper positive and negative reference. Luckily, I recently bought and picked up these two 12 volt batteries that I plan on using in my van, so I can actually test and verify that I'm right about this. If I wire these two batteries together, and I'm careful not to short circuit them, we can see that with a dual power supply setup, the op amp functions again and we get the gain and bias that we want. At this point, all we have left to do in order to accomplish my original goal of driving LED lights based off of the RCA output of my soundbar is to program the microcontroller to sample the analog signal coming off of the op amp output pin and interpret that signal, which can all be done in programming. Bear in mind that it also needs to handle adjusting the digital potentiometer if it needs to. Doing that is a whole beast in and of itself, however. There are already several really good videos and reading resources on using microcontrollers to sample music and control lights, so I won't go into the programming of that here. I wanted this to primarily focus on the hardware and circuit involved in properly preparing the analog signal so that it is safe for the microcontroller, which we've now done. Feel free to like the video if you enjoyed this and want to bookmark it for later. I find that I usually have to read about something or watch a video on it multiple times before I really get a good grasp of what it is I'm trying to learn. And with this, it took me many weeks of tinkering and ordering things online and trying things until I got the circuit working the way I wanted it to, and not in a way that was totally scuffed. Also feel free to check out the comment section and leave a comment if you feel so inclined. I am self-taught and by no means a master of this, so it is totally possible that I made a mistake or stated something wrong. And if I did, feel free to point that out in the comment section and go there, check if someone's pointing that out. Um, other than that, thank you for watching.